Hello, and welcome to another episode of AM's Talking with the Experts. I'm Mike Nichols, your host and AM's content and social media manager. And in today's episode, we're talking about some of the big issues and hot topics in hydromet monitoring and flood warning systems. I've got two guests joining me to provide some insight on the topic. Uh, first up, we've got Ryan Guerrero. He's AM's product manager for hardware. Ryan's got more than a decade of experience in hardware testing, field work, and business development in the environmental monitoring and hardware market with special emphasis on hydrological monitoring. So welcome, Ryan. Glad to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And awesome. My other guest is Chad Ballard. He's a senior engineer on AIM's professional services team. Uh, Chad is a licensed civil engineer in multiple states and a certified floodplain manager. He's also taught a number of university and continuing education courses in water resources, including advanced hydraulics and hydrology. So, Chad, really appreciate you being here. Thank, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, the decision to have the two of you on the podcast at the same time, I got to say that was intentional, fellas. Although you're both incredible experts in hydrometeorological monitoring, I mean, you two bring to the table some very different kinds of expertise, which I think complement each other very nicely. So, I think just to kind of set the baseline, why don't we just have each of you start off explaining to the audience a bit more about your respective areas of expertise. Um, Ryan, let's start with you. Yes, like you said, I've been in the game for a little while now. Um, done everything from from hardware test to field work, and I'm more of a, a very much a hardware person. So I've then moved into the sales and business development, and and now the. Uh, a product manager for our, our hydrological products and uh, I'm very hard, hardware focused. And so I like to geek out on the, you know, the devices and how they interact and the measurements they take and, and try to promote measurement fundamentals throughout the, the community. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Ryan. And Chad, how about you? Give us a little bit more about your background. How's that compare or contrast with what Ryan brings to the table? Yeah. So I come from the, I guess, engineering consulting world. So started off actually my career in software development, doing uh, some customer support for some numerical modeling software, but switched over to engineering consulting and uh, have done that ever since. Uh, worked for private clients, public clients, uh, anything from starting off as a staff engineer all the way up to uh, what they call a practice leader level, which is kind of head of yeah, you know the service for an entire firm. Worked at big firms and small firms. Like mentioned before, yeah, I come from yeah, licensed PE and that kind of back. Great. No, um, yeah, two very different perspectives on the same set of issues. So I'm excited to talk to you guys and get those different different viewpoints. And so speaking of that, I think let's go ahead and dive in. You've both been in the industry for a while, so I'd imagine quite a bit's changed over the years since you two got into the field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what are some of the big developments you've seen in either flood warning systems, hydrometeorological monitoring, say in the last few years? Um, Chad, let's start with you on this one. Yeah. Uh, top things looking at or thinking about, you know, what I've done in my career, the, the modeling world and how do we model floods? Uh, there's been a big impact of actually computer gaming industry and hardware that they've uh, a lot of development that's gone into that that we applied to all the numerical models that we do. So we could run fat models faster, larger models. Uh, we could run it more accurately, less assumptions that are built in. And uh, that really helps us with the, you know, answering the questions that our clients want for us and allowing those, those more detail and quicker. Oh, so, wow. I, I would have never thought, thought to connect those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so next time you get mad at your kids for playing computer games, they're helping in the flood world. <laughs> Perfect. So, so, Ryan, what about you? Uh, what's one of the top advancements you've seen over the last few years in the field? Yeah, uh, so honestly, so the electronics world, you know, since I started to where the electronics has gone to, you know, we're increasing reliability in the electronic world. We're decreasing cost in a lot of ways. Like, you know, a sensor that could... Now, um, you know, obviously some would say, hey, you know, a pressure transducer that cost me this, you know, five years ago now cost me even more it might be true. However, what, what you can get out of a sensor gives you more value also. So the electronics has really started to, to increase with the chipsets, you know, becoming more available after COVID and 
you know, what the chipsets can do is becoming very, very advanced. Um, <clears throat> you were being able to move into making better measurements that way. There's a lot of work being done in remote erosion monitoring and radar sensing technologies using different mediums. Like you would never believe that you could make a snow level measurement with radar in the past, but now it's become a, a more popular measurement and more reliable than ultrasonic sensing technology. So yeah, great things coming and I'm excited to see where it goes from there. That's great. Have you guys either of you seen any changes in the way like data is being collected and visualized? Any any shifts in the, those trends or no? I guess I, I mean there's always the trend of more online, more cloud computing, um, doing things, being able to share and access information from wherever you are. That's a, that's a trend. These systems are a lot of them that we work with are GIS based, and GIS has been around for a long time. But the application of you know, sharing data, sharing information, and being able to access and view that information from wherever is a, I guess, more recent. Yeah, I, I like that you were saying the sharing of data. So I was actually thinking of uh, like the visual visualization of you know, transparency, right? Like uh, the the populace itself is demanding more transparency and more, mm -hmm. and so you know, it used to be very rare when a flood control district or state agency would say, "Oh, and we want to make sure our public can see this data." Before it was, we're just going to make the data, we're going to make the decision, and we're going to we're going to tell people what they what they need to do. And now it's more, "Hey, here's the data. Here's here's why we're telling you to get out of here." And, and it's become more effective that way, also, I believe, in that. You know, you have less people standing back saying, well, weathermen are always wrong or blah, blah, blah. They can actually see the data in front of them and say, oh, my gosh, yeah, the hurricane really is going to hit us hard. So we should probably get out of this area. So I, I like that, you know, like you touched on that, the sharing of data has become really available for sure. Yeah. And I think the public, I mean, one, they're funding it all. So <laughs> they're, they're interested there, but, uh, but uh, yeah, being able to look at that data and use it for other purposes too. We focus on real-time kind of flood monitoring, but the engineering world, they're always looking for more data to, to do design projects and other things like that. So lots of, lots of uses for that data. So if you're able to share it and even within jurisdictions too, you, you know, if you're one city and you have a neighboring city, uh, you know, that's upstream of you, you know, you're, you, you want to be able to use that data because it, you know, that flood's coming your way, even though it's not within your specific, you know, political jurisdiction, the, the storm doesn't really care, you know? So uh, let's switch focus a little bit. So uh, talking a little bit about some of the uh, big advancements you guys have seen in the field, what have you seen as some of the top challenges in the sector? Ryan, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have two that come up in mind. One is you see a lot of increased budgets around the world. You know, we're DMs at global company and I've worked for companies that sell internationally. And so you keep seeing climate change and wanting to monitor more of the, the disasters around the world. You see all this increased funding. Well, increased funding also means increased funding towards developmental projects in hardware. So you get these engineering projects are quick solutions to the market. And when we're dealing with, you know, life and safety, sometimes these engineering projects don't have the best reliability or the support to make them a long-term solution or an accurate enough solution for safety purposes. And then also they promise low cost options most of the time. And oftentimes it ends up being low entry cost only. And so what the person doesn't realize is the amount of times they're replacing and doing maintenance on ends up being a very high operating cost, but a, maybe a lower entry level cost. So it's imperative to do your research on those. Um, and the second one kind of I noticed a push into the data only type services where hardware is not a, not a solution there. I know I'm biased because I'm a hardware guy, but all measurements start with some form of hardware. So you can't have that data if there's no hardware to take that measurement. And if you're just looking at data only, that leaves you at, you know, the mercy of QA, QC, of whoever's taking that data in to begin with. What level of maintenance are they putting into their hardware? And you can... Sorry, but you can only average out so much. There's only so much you can do with averaging to, to say that we've, we've pulled forward. So, and there's only so many data points being taken. So I've, I've often seen where someone say, well, I pulled this data from here and I pulled it from here and then from here, not realizing that those two areas were also using the same hardware. So you're really just averaging out the same data three times. So, you know, 
got to do your research and you really should, yeah. should trust, you know, some, some of your own hardware so you can maintain it and put the work in that you need to. Yeah. I think that garbage in garbage out. Right. So if you're not. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I had a good friend of mine always said, you know, no data is better than bad data, which I, I, I agree with a hundred percent. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Chad, what, uh, what about from your perspective? Top challenges facing the sector these days. Well, kind of building off a little bit what Ryan said, you know, with, with data, you know, there's a, we're dealing with some challenges where, you know, where we have areas that lack data and there's some approaches to try to make up for that. If you have minimal data, but uh, you know, like machine learning or some kind of artificial intelligence, but really those methods are based off of lots of data. And so working in areas that have a, a lack of data is challenging, whether it be, um, less populated areas or international areas, or this hasn't been a focus before that that's really tricky. And then probably on the flip side is once they do have that data, you, you normally are inundated with a whole bunch of, you know, values and numbers and being able to disseminate that into the, uh, decision-making, you know, I guess manageable levels for decision-making, uh, you know, you have all this information, how do you make decisions now? And how do I, you know, reduce that to, to be able to, you know, make accurate decisions. So kind of both sides, too much and too little are challenges. Yeah. yeah. And it, making those decisions, right, Chad, it's all, it is it's difficult when you're starting for new. I, I've dealt with a lot of districts that are planning new networks and being too broad, especially when a state wants to implement something at a state level that really hasn't dabbled in anything before or a country even. What is an appropriate water level to trigger an alarm for, you know? Yeah, you talk about sea level, you talk about all that, right? Datums. But usually it's some more like tribal knowledge that says, hey, look, we're going to start our triggering around this and we're going to make it more automated and more machine learning once we start getting that bigger data coming in. But we've got to start somewhere mm -hmm. and most people at a, at a higher rate level have a hard time doing that. So it's, it's interesting. It's not something someone thinks about. Okay, we, we will have data coming in. Do we know what we're going to do with that data on a you know very decision-making basis? But you, know, you see more of that than I do, but I know that it, it really is a struggle at first. Yeah. And a lot of times these municipalities, they might have, you know, they've, they've got Joe that's been working for him for 30 years and, you know, he, he knows all the places that flood in the city and he's familiar with it, but you know, what happens when he retires or he leaves and, and now you're, you're, you need, I guess, a more stable process that, that, that can build off of each other and get better with time rather than, you know, uh, take giant leaps backwards. And, and the worst yeah, case scenario, worst case scenario is we try to develop this because Joe left, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should yeah. get on this before Joe leaves, not yeah. after Joe leaves. But then there's always, you know, ever, you know, budget challenges. You know, no one has an unlimited budget just to to to, to solve these problems, and and uh, tends to be sure. you know, ebbs and flows depending on, you know, are you in a drought or did the last hurricane just hit? And so that political side kind of factors in, and that's a lot of times that's outside of uh, a lot of our control, but that's a factor that, you know, that's reality that you have to deal with. So, and so being able to use your resources effectively is, is, is a challenge. So with regard to that, that issue though, so what do we do about that? Um, is it public education? Lots of ways to do it. I, I know one of the ways I've seen it done very well is, you know, because the flood doesn't see the county lines and the city lines, the boundaries and, and the likes, right? And it's going to flood from upstream to downstream typically is how the flow operates. So oftentimes the, the larger city that is downstream, that's getting the funding, if they can realize that they have a good amount of money they can leverage into an upstream community that could benefit them and the upstream community and, and bridge that, you know, across that county line or across that city line where, where it's a, sometimes they're locked in for political reasons, but I found, you know, uh, in the Houston area, it's done a lot where they're getting you know, helping or surrounding communities from the large, you know, a large, and it's only helping everybody in a larger community rather than just, oh, this is our budget. This is our funding and we keep it to ourselves. It gives a, a earlier warning to the larger population anyway. So I think that's one of the ways I've seen work best 
in my opinion. But I, there's tons of ways of helping. You. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of Houston and Texas, uh, you know, I'm involved with the state flooding planning effort there. And that's a great way that the state's trying to address that where they have it's called the flood infrastructure fund or the fifth funding. And so it's a it's an avenue that, you know, the municipalities can can get funding for these types of projects. And then, you know, just cooperation. We we have some clients that, you know, they're the major city in the area and then they have to cooperate with smaller municipalities outside and uh, they they're able to share data between each other and, and come up with a, a kind of a win win solution. Because, you know, that, that city next to you might be further upstream. And so you you can't just go and put a rain gauge there that's outside of your jurisdiction. So you could use that city and then, you know, share share the information, share data that's gathered. And kind of everybody wins in that, that, that scenario. It makes sense. And then understanding your grants, I guess, as you were, you were talking, I was thinking, you know, what grants are available? Look. Do your research, try and find, and then share, talk to communities that, I mean, you can contact us. We have in the past helped, you know, connect communities with each other. Okay, this community just won this big grant. You know, this is the process they went through. And then maybe this other community could leverage some of what they did in order to potentially get that same grant. And if you need help with that, we're, we're obviously here to help yeah, mm -hmm. promote, promote measurements, promote, you know, the, the betterment of safety in, in the communities that we serve. So. That's, that's something yeah. to consider, right? And the sad thing is, though, the challenge is, you know, doing that before a flood event happens, because a lot of times it, it's post-flood event that that uh, yeah. a lot of this is then discussed, and, and it needs to be more of a consistent, all-the-time kind of discussion to prepare for that. So that's a Absolutely. challenge. All right, guys. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. This has been a great conversation. To bring it all together, Let's uh, just hypothetically, we've got someone coming to you. They were thinking about either uh, developing their first flood warning system or making some changes to an existing system. Give me the top pieces of advice you would offer that person. Very succinct, quick one sentence mm -hmm. pieces of advice. Who wants to go first? First thing that came to my mind was, you know, think in the long term. You know, yeah. you don't want to develop a system that then is going to be obsolete in a number of years or isn't maintained. And so don't forget that component. I've seen quite a few systems that, yeah, they're just kind of old and outdated and they, they've just kind of faded away. And once the community loses uh, confidence in that system, then it, it, nobody uses it. And so just think long-term, make sure that this is, you know, that's something that has uh, kind of, yeah, long-term effects in mind. Perfect. Think long-term. Ryan, what's one from you? Yeah, I, I would say that there's a lot of, knowledge out there some lots of years of experience and don't go it alone like a lot of people try and jump in and they want to make sure they make the right decisions and they're going to do this you know, without any help and it's, it's just unnecessary you know, there's a framework we promote and it's you know it's promoted worldwide and whether or not it's it's a AEM products that you end up going with or not you know there's a lot to consider there and it can be very overwhelming so reach out the community is there to help and uh, let's get you set up with the right expandable, highly maintained network rather than, you know, something that you piecemeal together because it fit your budget. There are ways to do things and make it expandable so that you can I think you can have a network that is what you need and not just based on a very limited view of what you can afford. So, you know, start here then increase with this and then increase to this and, and get budgets working to your favor rather than we purchase this one time off the shelf type deal because it fit in our budget and then we got burnt for the next 10 years. I hear that way too often. So reach out and make the right decisions. That's a great one. Chad, what's yeah, one yeah, more? we've helped a lot of clients kind of prioritize. It's like, all right, here's the most critical items. Implement those first. And then as funding or budgets change or you add to it over time, Instead of that way, you're kind of building your, your system rather than just having something. That's excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, Ryan, Chad, thank you both. Uh, you've had, this has been some great insight. Once again, thanks for taking time out of your schedules to be here. And also thanks to all of you for tuning in. Hopefully you found today's conversation as thought provoking as I did. Things really are changing in the field of hydrometeorological monitoring flood warning systems. We're seeing some important advancements, but we're also seeing some really important challenges coming out of the woodwork. 
So I hope today's session gave you some ideas about how you might embrace those advances while dealing with the challenges. Until next time, this is Mike Nichols for AEM and with Talking with the Experts.